we've looked at what the charge or the electric field around a single positive charge source charge looks like, a single negative source charge, um, a positive and a negative, a negative and negative, a positive and positive. There's one last uh, charge distribution that we need to look at because of its relative importance. And that is something that's going to be called a parallel plate capacitor. Okay, so what I want you to imagine, because I don't have one, is if I take two sheets of metal and they get held really close to each other without touching each other, right? Like that's obviously neither metal nor am I succeeding in getting them really close without touching each other. Um, but I will draw that. And so let's say I draw this and this, and we're looking at, uh, at this on a side angle. So these are two plates that look like that. And so it is two metal plates separated by an insulating material. often called a dielectric, and we've said that before. So two metal plates separated by an insulating material. And so let's say that my insulating material here is dry air or a vacuum or something. We're not going to get too complicated. So what do we do in this? Well, what we do is we charge up one of the plates. So let's say we charge this one up negative. And let's not discuss really how we get to that I will talk a little bit more about that. So if I charge this plate up negative, so I'm going to draw the excess negative charge. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe somehow I have a wire here and I'm doing something to force excess electrons onto the plate. Okay. And then let's say over here I have another wire going off to something. I don't know what it's going off to, maybe a ground. So what would happen then is if this plate got charged negatively, this plate would try to polarize, and so the electrons from this plate would leave the plate and go off, leaving the inside surface of this plate positive, right? So by charging one of the plates up and having a dielectric in here such that charge could not flow across the intervening space, the second plate polarizes to the opposite charge. And so this is a really important thing because this thing is as charged as this thing is. But when we talk about the net charge in a capacitor, it's not, uh, it's not this plus this because that actually would cancel out to zero. It's just whatever the charge on one of the plates is, is the charge on the other. And we tend not to talk about the sign of the charge on the parallel plate capacitor since one is positive and one is negative always. Right? So the parallel plate capacitor is often used to store charge. Right? Because if I force excess charge on one end, then I end up with that charge distribution here on the other end. That's not actually why we're talking about the parallel plate capacitor in this context. Um, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So here we are. So why do we care about the parallel plate capacitor? Well, let's start talking about what does the electric field in this region look like? So if I were to hypothetically put a little bit of positive charge right here, what direction would that positive charge go? Well, if you think about it, this is actually a complicated question because it's gonna have forces or it would theoretically have hypothetically forces on it due to each of these charges and due to each of these charges. Let's just pick a couple of samples, right? Say like due to this little bit of excess charge, this bit of excess charge, this bit of excess charge, this one, this one, and this one, just for parallelism, right? So what did the electric field do to this little bit of charge? Well, it would go away from that bit of charge there, right? from this one away, from this one away, uh, from this one it would go towards, because electric field lines go towards negative, oh, towards negative, towards negative. If you kind of see the pattern of what's going on here, you will note that the net electric field at this location in space must be just to the left there, because for every 
charge above, or rather for every charge kind of above this point, there's a charge below this point that, that balances out. Now, there's something here that I'm showing that's not quite true. So if I call this distance here D, the separation between the plates, and this distance here, if you think about it, is like a length of the plate. Remember, this is, it's not a line, it's actually a sheet, so it's like the length or the width of the thing, or oftentimes these parallel plate capacitors are uh, circular plates, so it might be a radius, or actually this would be a diameter, whatever. When you do a parallel plate capacitor, L is always much larger than D, right? So, the point of that is, even if I move just a little bit to the side here, you might say, oh, there's more charges up here than there are down here, but that's not really showing the, um, the, the, the scale of it appropriately, such that in between here, it looks like, or what should be true is, that we get an electric field that goes like this, just from the positive to the negative, straight across, okay? because the, the components kind of along the, the, the dimension of the length of it are gonna cancel out. Now, actually towards the edges of the parallel plate capacitor, we do get what are called edging effects, and it does bow outwards a little bit, but for the sake of our course, we are not gonna be concerned with edge effects. We're gonna be concerned with what's happening primarily at the beginning. So, what does this tell us? Well. First thing that this shows us is that inside a parallel plate capacitor, the direction of the electric field is uniform, right? From the positive plate to the negative plate. That's nice, so we have a uniform field. In all the other fields we looked at, it wasn't uniform. Depending on where you were with respect to the other charges, you could get pushed in all sorts of different directions. Here, in this particular power plate capacitor, I'm gonna get, if I'm a positive charge, I will get pushed to the left. If I'm a negative charge, I will get pushed to the right. right? That's how this functions. And I could draw this power plate capacitor in all sorts of different orientations, so we're not gonna get too hung up on that. right? So that's what the electric field looks like. But now, what we want to talk about is the strength of the electric field. So, if I were to pick three points inside my parallel plate capacitor, right? So, let's say uh, a point here, a point here, and a point here, A, B, and C. And uh, not that I've drawn that very well, um, I probably should make A uh, here. Because what I'm trying to do is just pick B to be directly in between the two plates, uh, and C is as close to the negative plate as A is to the positive plate. And the question here would be, at which position would the force on a hypothetical test charge, well, it's a like positive test charge, be the largest, right? So another way to phrase that question is at which point is the field the strongest, okay? So uh, you might as well just stop the video for a second, come up with an answer and think about it, come up with a reason. All right, hopefully you've done a lot of thinking there and let's talk about it. So, here we know that B is as far from the positive plate as it is as close to the negative plate. So, uh, a, a hypothetical charge would feel a certain amount of um, repulsion from the positive plate and a certain amount of re uh, attraction to the negative plate, okay? So if we're gonna write some notes there, so B, at point B, it's, uh, I would say equal or other the repulsion from the positive plate is going to be equal to the attraction from the negative plate, right? If we look at point A, I think it's pretty clear to see the repulsion 
from the positive is going to be greater than the attraction from the negative, right? Because you're, here you're closer to the positive plate. But see that the repulsion from the positive plate is less than the attraction from the negative. But here, if you think about it, these kind of have similar things going on. There's sort of a balance here because the way I drew it here, the repulsion from the positive is probably equal to the attraction from the negative and vice versa for point A and point C, right? So those, these probably have equal electric fields. But what about here where it's uh, the repulsion of the positive is equal to? Is it sort of an equal gradient there, right? Like is this repulsion as I go closer to the positive increasing at the same ratio that the attraction is decreasing? And so uh, it's actually a pretty complicated thing to prove, but um, what we can do is we can kind of go towards our guidelines here with our pictures. Remember that we said that the density of the electric field lines was proportional to the strength of the electric field? If you think about this diagram, right, no matter how many electric field lines I draw in here, there's never going to be one place in this, except at the edges, where the density of the field lines will be stronger, closer to this, or to this, or in the center, right? Such that it is actually true that the force on that particle at A would be equal to the force on that particle at B would be equal to the force of the particle at C, meaning the electric field at position A is equal to the electric field at position B is equal to the electric field at position C, right? And so here's why we love the parallel plate capacitor. In a parallel plate capacitor, there exists an electric field that is uniform in both direction and magnitude. So why is that important? And I hinted at it in an earlier video. It's important because this allows us to do experiments in an easier way, right? Because if the effect of the electric, uh, of the of charge is the same on a particle all throughout that field, that's a variable that we could pull out of what's going on and know that we can see things a little bit more predictively. So what that means is a charged particle has a constant acceleration in this field since the force is constant. Therefore, what's valid? Kinematics. So let's look at that. So uh, I'm going to orient my, part of my parallel plate capacitor in a different way. Let's say that the bottom plate is positive, the top plate is negative. So what does the field look like in there? All right. So it looks like this. And I'm just going to draw a couple of field lines. Okay. Uh, there we go. Beautiful. And let's say I have uh, an object. And that object is, I don't know, a little, maybe a pith ball. Yes, there we go, a pith ball. So that is a pith ball. Let's say the mass of our pith ball is equal to, I don't know, 30 grams, which actually for a pith ball would be quite heavy. All right, so we have our pith ball of 30 grams. So let's say our pith ball is also charged. Let's say it's charged with a certain, uh, a certain charge. Let's say the charge on the pith ball is, oh, I don't know, um, positive, um, positive, what do we make it positive? Four microcoulombs, awesome. Um, and let's say, uh, oh, I, I got it. Let's say that that pith ball, uh, because of that charge, well, let's see what would have happened to it. Well, let's talk a bit before we, we go any further. So let's look at the forces on the pith ball. Gravity is acting down. Now, why is gravity relevant here? 
Well, that's because we're not talking about atomic sized particles, we're talking about a pith ball. If this charged particle is positive, what direction of electric force is it experiencing? All right, uh, so positive things experience electric forces that are in the same direction as the field. So there we go, Fe, awesome. Let's say in this problem, if the pith ball is suspended, what is the field strength? Or I should say the electric field strength. Great question. So here we go. We can look at this. Uh, it's suspended. Okay. So what is that going to mean? Well, let's let's do our force problem here. I've got my free body diagram. Let's uh, pick a direction. Let's say up is positive, right? So there's our declaration for our force problem. Um, let's see any side calculations we can do. Aha! Uh -huh. We can find out what the force of gravity is. First, I need to turn this into. Uh, in kilograms, because we know when we go Fg equals Mg that we calculate that with kilograms. Hopefully we remember that. 9.8 newtons per kilogram. We'll side calculation 0.294 newtons then. Okay, that's the force of gravity. All right, let's write a net force equation. F net equals Ma for this. So I've got the uh, positive force of the electric, uh, electric static force minus the force of gravity equals ma. Oh, it's suspended, so a is going to go to zero here. Okay, so fe equals fg. fe, how do I calculate the electric force if I know the field? Ah, I can remember my other equation that we said fe was equal to q naught f, uh, or the q naught times e. Here my q naught is the pith ball, because remember this is the charge that's experienced in the force, so I can put that in. So that's four times 10 to the negative six coulombs. We always have to do things in coulombs. Uh, times the magnitude of the electric field is equal to uh, 0 0.294 newtons, and therefore the electric field strength is 0 0.294 newtons divided by four times 10 to the negative six coulombs, we can throw that in a calculator. I wish I had a calculator here, so I just got to bear with me because I left it in the other room. Um, so that is 0 0.0714425, um, uh, uh, um, and that's times 10 to the sixth uh, newtons per coulomb or 7450 newtons per coulomb, actually there, newtons per coulomb, right? Yes, cool, I think that is our answer. If I get something wrong, you can check me with the calculator, but that's the basics of this calculation. So this field is has a magnitude of 74,500 newtons per coulomb, and there you go to balance that. All right, so um, let's say, all right, now we do this, but now the electric field is, I do something and I don't know what that something is yet. We'll find out what the something is in the next video, right? What's controlling the size of the electric field in that parallel plate capacitor is how charged these are and what's controlling that. Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. Let's say now the electric field strength is 40,000 newtons per coulomb. And it's the same exact pith ball, right? That was suspended before. So what's gonna now happen to our pith ball if the electric field is now less? Well, hopefully what you're figuring out is that the electric force then is going to decrease. So now the net force is no longer going to be zero. So let's calculate what that is then. So Fe is going to be equal to Q naught, which hasn't changed, uh, times E. So now I have four times 10 to the negative six coulombs times the electric field strength, which is uh, four times 10 to the one, two, three, four, positive four uh, newtons per coulomb. So what's that? 16 times 10 to the negative two uh, newtons, which is uh, 0 0.16 newtons. Okay, going back to net force is equal to ma. And I had Fe minus Fg, because there's no need to change our declaration from up. 
is equal to ma, and so 0.16 newtons minus 0.294 newtons is equal to 0.03 kilograms times a. And if you notice here, this is gonna have a net force downwards. So a net force of 0. Um, 134 newtons is equal to 0 0.03 kilograms. And this thing is going to accelerate downwards then. So here we go, that acceleration is gonna be downwards, right? That's what that negative sign there means. I'm just gonna move these two things over so I can just see how to do this. Um, uh, do, 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 four, there you want, uh, four, zero, two, um, point, uh, sorry, 44.06 four um, oh, repeating meters per second per second. Okay, so there it accelerates downwards. So what's gonna happen? Well, let's say I know that the distance between the plates is um, um, 20 centimeters, right? That means where this is was halfway, uh, 10 centimeters. This thing is gonna start accelerating there. Let's say it starts from rest we might wanna know, well, how fast is it going when it gets here? Okay, so it's gonna just fall down there. Okay, well, what can I do? Well, I know that the initial velocity is zero. I know that the acceleration is negative 44.6 repeating, so we'll just say seven meters per second per second. And I know that the, uh, the displacement's under gonna go, uh, I'll just use delta y, because it's a vertical, is 0 0.1 meters. Okay, and if I wanna know how fast, Maybe I wanna know how long it takes. Well, let's do both questions. How fast and how long? Well, how fast? I would use Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus two A delta, whatever the displacement vector is there. Oh, remember our kinematic equations? <gasps> yes, okay. Two times negative 44.7 meters per second per second. And hold on a second. Looks like I'm gonna get the square root of a negative number. Oh no. Remember, we said up is positive, this displacement must be negative. If you ever get something wonky, you should always go back and check your, um, your variables there. So I've got Vf squared is equal to, um, so that's gonna be like what, um, um, uh, 89.4, uh, square root of 89.4, um, you know, that's gonna be, I mean, I'm just totally guessing because I don't have my calculator here, um, but that's gonna be about like 9.3 meters per second-ish. I'm not so worried, plus or minus, and I guess we check the minus because up was positive, um, and there we go. Uh, you could just check my math there. If I want to know the time, I'd probably use VF is equal to VI plus AT now, because I know that, that, and that. That would have been one to do. I could have also used delta Y is equal to VIT plus one half AYT squared. Okay, right, because I know that that term goes to zero. I know what that is. I know what that is. I could have found the time. So kinematics is valid. Everything is awesome. And there we go about how to do that problem. Um, so depending on, you know, what that the electric field is, that would determine whether this thing would accelerate down or accelerate up, um, and there we can go. Now, what's an application of that? Like, why do I care about that? Well, an interesting thing I can do here is, let's say I have a particle, right? Uh, but my particle, let's not say it's a pith ball, let's say it's actually like an electron or something. And I make this negative and this positive, I can control the electric field here. So, I mean, obviously this is not the size of an electron, but there you go. What's the electron gonna do? Well, the electron is going to move in this direction, speed up, and then if I leave a little opening in the plate, I can then shoot the electron out like that with a velocity, and I can predict how much that electron uh, uh, speeds up. And believe it or not, this is actually the mechanism um, that people use for televisions forever and ever. Old televisions uh, had an electron beam that was sped up using a parallel play capacitor. And then like if this is my screen, the electron would hit different points on the screen and then make them flash. And that was, you know, uh, and then what, what would have to happen is that the electron would have to have hit different points on the screen with different speeds to make that flash bright or not bright and that, uh, that, that controlled the picture. But how would I get the electrons at different points in the screen? Well, what there was, was another parallel plate capacitor. Let's say I wanted to make the thing hit down here. What would I do? Well, I'd make this top plate negative and this plate positive because this would want to travel in a straight line towards here, 
but I can get, if there is an electric field upwards here, this negative particle would be deflected downwards and it would go like that, right? Actually, it would go like that, uh, like this here. What, what shape is that? Oh my God, that's, a, that's like a parabola. This thing is in projectile motion here because it has a, uh, a, a, a constant force that is perpendicular to the initial motion. That's the same thing as what we had when we just threw a ball off a cliff. We had just gravity acting constantly downwards. Now, one error with my picture is this from here to here ought to be a straight line. Well, why? Well, hopefully what you said is that in this region, it's experiencing the electric force, but once it leaves the parallel plate capacitor, there's no more electric force. So Newton's first law says an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed in a straight line. So we can relook at projectile motion problems and we're gonna do that. So uh, parallel plate capacitors let us do all this stuff and are really, they're really, really great because they allow us uh, a lot of modern invention excuse me, use parallel plate capacitors. Uh, we've since come up with more clever ways of doing this, but uh, this is basically the invention of television. Um, so one last thing here to set us up for the next video. Take a look at this. How, if, if I had just like had a ball here and I dropped the ball, we could have used kinematics in order to figure out how um, how fast it was going, right? Uh, gravitational potential energy becomes kinetic energy. Doesn't that sort of seem similar to what's going on here? Except that there's electric fields and gravities going on, so there's multiple things. Um, what we're gonna find out, and that's actually the purpose of the next video is, here, this electron sped up there. It has kinetic energy when it leaves. Well, where did that come from? And what it came from is something that we're gonna call electric potential energy, right? So that when a charged object is in an electric field, it has electrical potential energy in the same way that an object with mass in a gravitational field has gravitational potential energy. So the next video is gonna all talk about energy from the electric sense.